evening and welcome once again to Heart Fire, the Libertarian TV show. Uh, my name is Steve Finger, Dr. Steve Finger, and I'm uh, the host of the show tonight. Tonight's show was uh, intended to be uh, a live debate for the contenders for the seat of the 11th Cong Congressional District. As most of you know, Major Owens, who served in that capacity for, four ye for 20, 20 years, 24 years, uh, retired and the, uh, there are five people contending for his seat in the Democratic primary. Uh, unfortunately, the other four contenders chose not to show up, and so today our guest is Chris Owens, who happens to be the son of Major Owens. Uh, Chris Owens is a graduate of Harvard University, undergraduate, and got his master's in public affairs at the Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs at Princeton University. Uh, Chris has special interests in health care and education. He's married and the father of uh, two children and lives in the district in Crown Heights in Brooklyn. Good evening, Chris. Pleasure to have you here. Thank you, Doctor. Now, we have a number of questions pertaining to the, uh, your duties if you were to become elected to Congress. Uh, before that, would you like to just take a minute and tell, your voter, tell the voters why you think you should be taking your father's seat in the Congress? Well, first, let me thank you, Dr. Finger, for having me on the show. I thank Hard Fire for having me. This is not my first time on the show. I enjoy coming on to the show. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, I think that it's very important that we have shows like this because the reality is in this day and age when there is so much money spent on media, it is important that the public get an opportunity to see free media and that candidates get an opportunity to be seen and not have to spend money to be seen. So I really appreciate this opportunity. I was born in San Juan, Puerto Rico. My mother was teaching there at the time in, at the university. My parents were born, were married there. And my father was working in, in Brooklyn as a librarian. And so my life actually started just outside the mainland of, of New York. And I came here when I was very young and have lived in Brooklyn ever since. In fact, I've lived within this congressional district ever since. And I feel that I know the district well. Not only have I lived in Crown Heights, I've also lived in East Flatbush and Brownsville as well. Mm -hmm. And the part of Crown Heights I reside in is, is Prospect Heights actually now. Um, and the reality is that I know the district so well. I've worked in the nonprofit sector. I've worked in the public sector. I've worked in the private sector as a small businessman. So I know what's going on in this district. I've been a member of a community school board, and I'm a parent and dealing with the issues today that are going on in this district as a parent. So I feel that I'm very, very well equipped to tackle all of the issues. I've worked with my father for many, many years on policy issues as well as political issues. So we're ready to okay, go. OK, OK. Okay, now I, I'm going to just start with the questions, and uh, I will try to cover most of the things that you would be faced with uh, if you were if you were to be elected in Congress. Um, most Americans now are especially concerned with the war in Iraq. It's a major issue for most people. And I was wondering, uh, do you believe that we should have gotten involved in the war uh, in the first place? And secondly, now that we're there, and more importantly, what do you think we ought to do about it now? Well, there are three phases that I'd like to identify in dealing with the war issue. Number one, should we have gone in and going in? We were misled. In many ways, this country was misled. Our president lied to us, and that's what I firmly believe. But even if we had not been misled, military options were not the option to deal with at that time. And so all of that was stripped away from us by an administration and a Republican Party that was dead set on having military action and making national security such an excuse for their political power in the aftermath of 9-11. And I feel that that was absolutely wrong. We should not have gone into Iraq the way we did. We should probably not have gone into Iraq at all. The second phase of this is the chickenness of the Democratic Party. Democrats rolled over and supported this war. Too many Democrats rolled over and supported this war. Some did not, including my father and others who stood up and said, no, we can't do this. But many <clears> did. And that was one of the problems. It's taken us a long time to find our voice, to understand that we don't have to be beaten into submission by a party that's using mm. security issues as a way to leverage its political power. And then the third phase, what do we do now? Well, now that everyone's jumping on board, now that everyone's realizing that we shouldn't have been there, things that we were saying all along, now the issue is what do we do? We've got to get out. We've got to get out very fast. We have already undermined our entire position in the Middle East. We've undermined our ability to deal with Iran because we have created a mess in Iraq. 
if Iraq is going to become a democracy or any kind of democracy that remotely resembles what we have, they're going to have to deal with it for themselves. If Iraq, Iraq, if Iraq is going mm -hmm. to become a democracy, okay. they're going to have to deal with that themselves. Mm -hmm. We cannot impose it. Mm -hmm. We can no longer be a constructive partner in it. We need to get out, and how fast we get out is a function of how we safely get our troops out of there. The safety of our troops and the safety of our nation from a security standpoint depends on getting out of Iraq and then being equipped to deal with the other threats that are out there. So you think that we should get out as quickly as possible? Absolutely. And, uh, and the consequences of staying would be worse than the consequences of getting out? Absolutely. Okay. On a, on a, on a related question, would you say that preemption is ever justified? Uh, we all agree that if the United States were, were to be attacked, that we would have every justification in responding, and that was the case in World War II. Uh, but what about a situation where the intelligence gets things right? which does happen from time to time, I'm told. And we know that there's a, a strike that's imminent, whether it's from a, a, web, a weapons, of a WMD or some other strike, but, but the strike has not been launched. Uh, would you be in favor of preemption, of, of attacking the country that was prepared to attack us, or would you feel that we would have to wait until the attack was actually launched? Well, I feel the reality is that there is no scenario like that that's going to exist. And the reason why I say that is because we will never know if the intelligence is getting it right. Mm -hmm. And that's the problem. One of the problems of this whole scenario that we're dealing with with Iraq and now with Iran is that we don't know how reliable the intelligence is. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> this is a, a game that's been going on for hundreds of years between nations. If we're going to use a <coughs> philosophy of preemptive strikes, then what we are setting is a world that is ready to kill each other. Mm. on a rumor. That's what it comes down to. And the reality is this. Preemptive strikes are obsolete as a strategy because we have the weapons now that can wipe out portions of the world, not a country, not a city, not a person, but portions of the world. And what we do to one nation affects everybody. So how can we say that we're going to engage in preemptive strikes as a policy? Obviously, if there's an isolated case where something is, you know, 100% known, mm -hmm. I don't believe that can be, then maybe that's a possibility. But that's a case-by-case -case situation. Well, that's what that I meant, in a case-by-case -case situation. Is, in other words, I, I was just trying to pick your brain here a little bit. Do you feel that preemption in general is, is the wrong way to go? If we, yes, if we have I a, do. If we, have, if, we real, if we know that a foreign, party, a foreign power or al-Qaeda was about to launch a strike, and we knew they were about we to launch a strike. We will not. We will not know. And we have. So you feel the intelligence would never be would never be accurate it's enough. We should be wait until enough. until we were actually attacked before we actually responded. We need to wait until we see action. Action and attacks are two different things. Right. For example, the the president of the United States, Bill Clinton, took action when he was aware of where terrorists were in the Sudan mm -hmm. during the summer of 1998, if I believe uh, that was correctly. Okay. He had information that he thought an action was going to take place, and yes, they fired missiles. Well, now, that's what I'm in, talking about. In, in, the real, in reality, that, that intelligence was inaccurate. Mm -hmm. the, the folks were not there, and okay. people, were not, people were not killed. So they took that, they took that <coughs> action because they thought there was an action taking place, not an attack. Now, how are we going to make these distinctions? How are we going to decide how many innocent lives are going to be sacrificed on that side as well as on our side because of what we do and do not know? Okay. So I, I can't support that as a policy. Okay, okay. On, on an also related issue, what do you think we ought to do about Iran and North Korea? Should we do anything? Should we try to prevent them from, should we try to prevent Iran from having nuclear, nuclear weapons? Or do we wait until they develop the nuclear weapons and just deal with the consequences? No, we have to do everything possible to <coughs> prevent the development of nuclear weapons in Iran. Right. Now, everything possible means that we have to engage the international community, something we failed to do mm -hmm. in the Iraq situation. Okay. We have to engage the international community in the most constructive way possible, and the key is we have to buy time. Now, some people don't like to use that phrase, but that's what it comes down to. It comes down to buying time because the Iranian people the Iranian people are not in favor of their leadership. Basically, the Iranian people don't want to be isolated. They don't want to be in a situation like Iraq was because they're looking next door and they're seeing the destruction and the havoc that has been wreaked on Iraq. The Iranian people, the average age of the Iranian population is moving down. 
younger and younger. These are folks who want to come closer to America. They do not want to come farther away from us. They will not support their leadership in taking the types of actions that the leadership is talking about. So you think that people are going to prevent the leadership from developing a nuclear, uh, a nuclear capacity? I believe that if we buy time, we will create the political right. will within Iran to slow down whatever Iran is thinking of doing. And in the meantime, the amount of time needed to develop nuclear weapons by Iran is still years away. The fact that they've developed some that's uh, for their own plutonium use in terms of energy does mm -hmm. not mean they're ready to, to launch a bomb. All the experts agree they don't have a bomb now. And they're not they don't have, have a bomb yet. And they're not going to have a bomb for a number of years. Some so, people say three years, four years, well, five years. Well, you know, again, that's intelligence, that's estimation, right. and we have to do everything if, if possible. If they move in that direction, what should we do? Or should we do anything? We we are limited because of right. what we did in Iraq. Right. We don't have as many military options right. as we might have had. Do you have any, any suggestions to what might be done, or do we just uh, I, hope for the best? No, we don't just hope for the best. But right. what I will say is, yeah. when I'm elected to Congress and I have access to the information that leaders need to have access to, then, you'll make then a decision. I'll make a decision. Okay, I won't pin you down. Not, that I is not something I'm going to speculate on okay. as a private citizen. Okay, that's perfectly okay. All right, on a related issue, uh, immigration is much in the news lately. Um, some people have proposed a guest worker program, and we have 10 million illegal aliens in this country now. Do you have an opinion as to what we should do as far as uh, letting immigrants into the country on a, on a temporary basis? And what do we do with the people that are here now? I think the, the Republican Party and the current administration is taking the totally wrong approach. Number one, we can't criminalize the people who are here. These are folks, some came here, they overstayed well, the visas. Well, they are technically criminals. We're not criminalizing we, we, them. We, we are, we are here criminalizing the them to the extent that we're going to round people up, arrest them, and deport them. In fact, as of today, some of that action has already started as a result of the protests that took place over the past couple of weeks. Right. And that is un-American. I mean, we have to think about it. Most of these people are people who've been working hard. They've been trying to build a life in America. That's what America is all about. And if we're going to take the position that the folks who've been here are, all have to be deported, it's not practical and it is not moral. What do you think we so should I do with them? That. I think we have to create a path to citizenship. We have to tell everybody, look, you have, by this date, you must come and you must register to get your green card. You will be given your green card immediately. Everyone will be given their green card immediately. We will begin the process of investigating your background mm -hmm. to see if there are any issues that must be addressed. If there are issues, then you risk deportation. But the reality is, if you don't get come get your green card by X date, then you definitely will be deported. So here we are, we're giving you a second chance to get it right. Then we will work towards get, making you a citizen as fast as possible. At the same time, we need to set a date where we're going to hold employers accountable for hiring people who are illegal because we create the market for people to come if they know they have jobs. So employers must be held accountable, but you can't just say we're going to do that tomorrow. You have to set a date and say, okay, you've got two years, and at the end of two years, you have no excuse. You should have gotten your registration right. You should have checked everybody who was employed, and that's the way we have to go. If you mess up, you're in big trouble. And then the third piece of this, which nobody wants to talk about, we've passed the North American Free Trade Agreement, we've passed the Central American Free Trade Agreement, we've passed these free trade agreements that have undermined the economies of the other nations. Folks are coming here from Mexico, for example, because NAFTA has not delivered the jobs for Mexico that it was supposed to deliver. So the desire to come here to get jobs has been increased by the very policies of this administration and those who like to feel... You feel that, that NAFTA freedom. has hurt the economy in Mexico? How Absolutely. Did, how did they do There's that? There's documentation that, that, that the ability of small farmers and, and employees and small businesses have been undermined and have lost their jobs because of NAFTA. Well, is that because the agricultural sector in this country is so heavily subsidized? Subsidized that it's difficult for them to compete. Why, no. would, why would free trade? Why would free trade with between because Mexico and this country hurt the hurt the economy? Usually, free trade helps NAFTA, everybody. What NAFTA and CAFTA has done mm -hmm. is it has allowed corporate interests to go more freely to other nations. It has allowed they're, they're corporate competing interests un, unfairly with the, with the small farmers. Absolutely, that, it's like bring, bringing the big box stores into our neighborhoods. Right. You know, if you bring Home Depot into a local neighborhood, you're really going to put the local lumberyard and, and, and the, local, uh, the local hardware stores out of business. Well, that's and a, that's what people are very concerned with. That's another Walmart, issue. If you bring that's, Walmart into yeah. your neighborhood, you're putting local businesses out well, of business. No, wait, it's wait, the wait, same wait. concept. No. Okay, I don't want to dwell too long on this Walmart business, but basically um, many people feel that, that when Walmart comes into an area, it offers people an option of better goods at a cheaper price. Otherwise, they wouldn't patronize the Walmart. 
but well, I, I understand that, and we right. all want to get things at the cheapest price available. But it's the cost. There's a price for the price. Okay. And the cost is the people who work there don't have the benefits. They don't make the the wages they should be making. That's why there are organized efforts to stop Walmart, and they put other smaller businesses out well, of business. Well, that's probably true. That's that's true. Anytime there's a change, but people do have the choice as to whether or not they want to work there. But, uh, but small businesses generate more jobs for our economy, and they keep neighborhoods together. And so we need to protect small businesses. We should protect, OK. Um, not wanting to beat a dead horse anymore with this. Uh, I think you felt that employers should be fined if they hire uh, immigrants who are not in this country legally. Do you feel that, that it's appropriate to, to, in effect, deputize employers and force give them the onus of checking their employees to see whether they're here legally or not? Absolutely. First of all, there's already precedent for that. I mean, you have to fill out paperwork when you hire somebody that mm -hmm. essentially is supposed to represent that they are or are not here legally. But more importantly, we have the ability now for anybody who is somebody who has come from out of the country. We have the ability to have electronic records, and we should get to the point within the next three to five years where every employer should be able to check every employee as to their status. That's the bottom line. And okay. if they're not registered, so to speak, in the appropriate way, then yes, it's on the employer to say, I'm sorry, I can't hire you. And the employer should be fined or otherwise penalized. And the employer, if the employer penalized. violates the law, the employer should be fined or otherwise okay. penalized. Yes. And I think you mentioned that you were not in favor <clears throat> of, a, of a temporary guest worker program where workers would be able to come in seasonally, for instance, in the agricultural industry or hotel industry, uh, would not be able to come into the country on a temporary basis to work in these industries. That is correct. I do oppose that. Right. And what would we do for the shortfall for the people well, the who are doing that is now? We, ha we have unemployment. There are plenty of people who need jobs, and they will take jobs if they're available. The issue is that if you create a situation where folks are coming in who are essentially there to be exploited, not to live here, not to become citizens, but to basically work at the whims of certain employers and then basically be kicked back out again. That is not the way to manage an economy, nor is it a way to manage the morality aren't they of taking, Aren't they taking jobs that are not being filled by people here already? Those jobs will always be filled if they're available and if people need jobs. The issue is, as long as there's somebody there willing to take it for less money, and to work under worse working conditions, then those jobs will be filled by those people. So you this feel is that these jobs would be filled if the wages were just raised a little bit? Absolutely. But then, of course, that would raise the prices of the goods. So Which is, which is more important, to have productive tax-paying citizens who are working or to pay one cent more for an apple? Well, it's not really a matter of one cent more. It's well, a question of people having the choice of what they want to do. But OK, all right. Uh, Moving on to the next topic, education, which is a major, a major issue in this country. Um, many people have suggested that the public school system, while good for some people, is not good for everybody. And that people should, that parents should have a choice as to what they, where they want to send their children. Uh, New York City, for instance, the New York City public school system spends approximately 13000 over $13,000 per child. And some people have suggested that parents have the right as uh, the right to decide where that money would be spent so that a parent would have the right to take that money and go to a, another school, go to a private school. Do you, do you have any feelings about that as to whether we should have a voucher system which allows parents the choice of where they want to send their children since they're paying the taxes already? Well, first of all, we have to understand that public education is the foundation of a civil society and certainly the foundation of a su successful democracy. We would not be where we are as a nation if we did not have the public school system that we had. And the reality is it brings people together. It shows people how we have to live together. So we must remember that public education is more than just what you learn in your books. It is what you learn from the people around you and how you live. So that's, that's paramount. And I support public education. Therefore, I do not support a voucher-based system or taking money out of the public education system for other purposes. I understand that people have a choice. If they want to choose to spend more money to send their children elsewhere, that's their choice. But they have, they have an obligation because that public education system contributes to their well-being as well down the road. They have an obligation to support it whether their children attend those schools or not. Well, what about the parents whose kids are in, in dangerous, poorly performing schools? Parents are paying taxes and the taxes are going to the public schools. The kids only go through one time. If they go through, if they finish the first grade, that first grade is not going to be revisited. So should the, shouldn't the parents have a choice as to where they want to send their kids? I mean, the, public, the government pays for education, 
but does the government have to provide it? In most areas, government pays for certain things, but people have a choice as to where they're going to get it. What would be the problem with a parent getting a decent education for their kid uh, in a private school if the public school is not providing the, the, the education for them? Well, I think that you're presenting two extremes. The reality is you can have choice, as has already been implemented to some degree within New York City, within the public schools. <clears throat> excuse me, within the public school system, you don't have to leave the public school system to have choice. One of the efforts that this uh, administration at the Department of Education has tried to bring forward is to both improve the schools, which is the real answer, mm -hmm. and to provide some choices for parents who are concerned about the local public school. That is where we have to focus our energy, improving all the schools. I'm about equality. I believe that the new standard for political action in this country, the new standard for Democrats, should be achieving equality for everybody. If you use that as your standard, then you take on every public school and you make it equal to every other public school to make sure that they're offering the same excellent teachers, the same curriculum, <coughs> the same resources, the same art and music that every other school has. And that has to be our burden. If we try and abdicate that, if we take shortcuts, then all we're doing is selling our entire society short. We are not addressing the real issue. Well, what about in the interim, in the few years that it takes to get excellence in all the public schools, which we've been trying for many, many years, what do you tell the parents who say, look, I don't, I don't have 10 years to wait for this to happen. My kid is going to go to school next year. And the school that he's going to go to is in not a safe school. It hasn't been approved. It's unsafe, and it gives a poor education. Uh, there's a private school down the block that I could take my tax money to, why can't I put my kid with my tax money in a different school? You tell them you want to just homogenize them and, and give everybody a poor education. Why, why, why shouldn't that parent do that? The reality is this. If all of the parents and all of the people who live in the communities where there are poor quality public schools mm -hmm. turn out and vote in elections and put the pressure on their elected officials, you will see changes almost overnight in those schools. We have to speak out. We have to fight to change schools. It doesn't well, happen how, how overnight. Will, how will elections make the very, public schools better? It happens very quickly when people how? know that you care. Because parents people have been have caring be for 50 years. If they, if they leave the public schools, that would show they care. That would send a message. Well, if they in fact, leave in the places in Wisconsin, they can afford to, that they can't afford to, then they have to fight well, for their schools. That's because the public, because the, the taxation is so high that they don't have the money. They can't pay for both. When the Clintons came to Washington, when the Clintons came to Washington, they had a choice with Chelsea. Uh, Chelsea could have gone, was offered the opportunity to go to any public school in Washington. And instead, the Clintons, who were able to afford a private school, sent her to a private school. Somebody said this was the, the first family to live in public housing and send their kids to give kids a private education. And, uh, and the Washington schools are no better now than they were then. Why shouldn't poor well, parents who Dr. can't Finger, afford to pay twice, why shouldn't they have not, the same that, choice? That's not, that's not a fair comparison, and you know it. I mean, the daughter of the President of the United States, uh, looking at where she goes to school compared to everyone else, is, is not the same situation. There are security issues, all kinds of issues with the first that's child. That's correct. And she, if and she had gone to a public school, she would have gotten a decent a public education. That is an unfair comparison. The reality is that we have a school system that we pay for. It should be the best school system, and we should all be fighting for it. The people who are getting good schools in some parts of this district or some parts of the city should be fighting for the same good quality public schools in other parts of the city and the district that the people who have the bad schools are fighting for. And that's what our goal should be. And the reality is that I meet teachers every single day. I meet parents every day who care about their schools and who are doing great work in public schools, even some of the hardest public schools. Mm -hmm. The will is there. The management may not be there, but the will is there. Look, and I don't, we think, need I don't to go think anybody there. disagrees that we all want good public schools, and we've wanted them for many years. But the fact is that many of the public schools are very poor. They're poor quality. And the, but the why question is, what do you quality? do? They're poor quality because there's been discrimination, because basically we wrote off entire neighborhoods. That's the problem. District 23 well, in no, Brownsville. Wait a That's District not true. 23 in Brownsville is an area that people don't care about because it is filled with public housing, it is filled with poorer people, and basically it's been written off. Chris, so I gotta disagree is, with you because for I used to be years and years, I have to those tell schools you, suffered. Now they're well, beginning to change. But um, they suffered for years because nobody cared about what happened to the people in those schools. Nobody cared about what I they were going to do to interrupt in the economy. You for one second because I, that does not happen to be exactly true. When I, I was a teacher before I went to medical school 
And I taught Good. in these schools. I taught in the schools that were in public housing. And at that time, we used to call them special service schools. And all of the money was directed into the areas that you're talking about. We had special rules where so there why were did smaller they fail? classes. Why did you fail? Uh, with the, I, <laughs> why did you fail? I mean, I, the, question, the question is, obviously. There were bad schools. The kids got a rotten education. I don't know what makes a bad, school? What, what makes a bad, but, well, the, what but makes a good you know, we can doctor. debate what should make a good and a bad school. But in the meantime, what do you tell the parents? You know, you say we want to make good schools, and we all want. We want good education, we want good health care, we want good food, we want good housing, we want good clothes. But in the meantime, parents got this kid, and here's a private school that can give them a good education at a lesser price. What's the harm? Instead of spending $13,000 in a public school, give, what, why not give them $6,000 to use in a, in a private school, and this kid gets a decent education instead of and losing generation six, after generation after generation. $6,000 that is lost to changing our entire public school system. Well, yes, that's true. Difference. That's true. But, but you take the kid out. Child. But you take if you if you're going to put $13,000 in for the in, into the school for each kid and you say you're going to take $6,000 to a private school, leave $6,000 in the public school, the public school is going to have more money for the remaining kids. The other kid is going to be getting a decent education at a, at a private school. Who's hurt? The definition of a public school system, the definition of how government works in public goods is not one child at a time. The definition is how do we benefit the entire population. Okay. And that's where we have to go. Okay. It seems that we've that we've we've beaten this to death already and we're we're running out of time. And uh, I know you wanted to make a closing statement, Chris, and uh Well, I just wanted to point out to everyone who's watching, and again, thank you for watching because I think it's important that my commitment to changing the way politics is done in this country is very firm. I'm a progressive Democrat. I believe it's important to be active and to fight for what we care about. I've been endorsed by John Conyers, Maxine Waters, Dennis Kucinich, Bernie Sanders, and John Lewis, and many others as part of my battle to become your next congressman. And I hope I get your support. Thank you. Okay, we seems like we have a little, a little more time here. Um, maybe we can just do one or, one or two more questions. Um, I'd like to ask you on a, on a little different issue here, Chris, uh, on the issue of drugs. Uh, medical marijuana has been much in the news where uh, uh, the con Congress has, the uh, federal government has stopped local, uh, local initiatives that would allow medical marijuana uh, by prescription. Do you have a feeling about that? Do you think patients should be allowed to use marijuana? or the federal government should tell them they can't do it, if the state wants it? My, my gut reaction, personally, has always been that medical marijuana should be allowed to be used medically, uh, that people have those concerns should be allowed that. But I'm not going to pretend to know enough about this topic to take an official position on it. I know what I've heard over the years, but I've never studied it enough. So suffice it to say that I incline to say that folks should be allowed to use it for medical purposes, but I'm not going to commit to that. Okay, fair answer. Anyway, time seems to have flown by, and we're ready to close our, uh, our program here. We want to thank Chris Owens for, for coming in, remind the, our viewers that all of the candidates were invited, but they chose not to. Uh, thank you for uh, viewing another issue of Hot Fire, a libertarian program that reminds our viewers that the Founding Fathers tried to tell us that it's important. The Founding Fathers were in favor of living free or die, not living for free or die. Thank you very much and good night once again.